So one of the things that I want to talk to you about is, hold on, I didn't prepare any questions. (laughs) This is me being a bad example of an interviewer. No, okay. That's, no, here's a perfect, let's, I got you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Freelance Friday podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm here today with a friend of the show. (laughs) (laughs) You're so weird. I can't say that and take it seriously. I've always wanted to say that, but Mm -hmm. we're here with a friend of the show, Norris Howard, who also happens to be a friend of my life. Friend of my, really? Friend of my life? Man, friend of my life. Okay. My life partner. There it is. The, That's better. The human I share a dwelling with. There we go. Um, but no, seriously, Norris does some really cool things in the internet-y, you know, content creation, new, new media space. Yeah. And he's actually been on the show before. We have an episode from, I don't know, two seasons ago. But I thought it was time for an update because a lot of things have changed since that episode. Yeah. And... Really, the focus, we'll talk to Norris a little bit about his career, what he does, that kind of thing. But really, the focus of this episode, I wanted to be about interviewing because I get questions all the time, like, how do you host a successful interview? What are some tips? What are some tools that you use? I know a lot of you guys are looking to start podcasts and YouTube channels and things Mm -hmm. like that. So we're going to get take kind of take a deep dive into the art of the interview, if you will. But first, Norris... Do you want to take a minute to just tell the world, <laughs> tell the folks out there who you are and what you do? Yeah. Um, so I am currently a, a host slash producer on a radio show about video games and about esports. If you're unfamiliar about what esports is, that's professional video games is something I've been passionate about for the vast majority of my life. Um, it is literally the reason why I went to journalism school uh, was to talk about video games or politics, one or the other. It was going to end up one of those. Um, and I think the last time I was on the show, uh, I was still it was still sort of a pet project. It was something that uh, some friends of our some friends of mine uh, we got together, made a show, and you know wanted to see where it went. Eventually, uh, our company was purchased by a Beasley Media Group, and we now are full-time employees of Beasley. Uh, they're one of the biggest radio uh, and media companies in the country. And so we've, uh, we joined them, and they bought us out, and now we do our content for them. And, and through, their, uh, through their resources, really, we've been able to, I mean, take the show and do all sorts of new and cool stuff with it so um yeah sweet link link in the show notes yeah yeah it's um pretty cool they're all over the web but um yeah you know i tune in i enjoy what they do i'm not really i actually get a lot of people asking me this if i play video games too because i date you and i'm always like sharing you guys this stuff (laughs) and well how would you answer that question not only when like (laughs) i twist your arm about it but I mean, that's not true. No, recently it's 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 strange because as you say, you, you know, or as you spend time with people, especially if you live together, like some of the things invariably that you like will cross over into the other person's life. I know with you, uh, for me, it's a lot of like business stuff and like music stuff. There's a lot of stuff I wouldn't have listened to had I not been with you, and obviously the entrepreneurial stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, every now and then there's a game that I'm just like, I think she might dig this or she'll see me playing it. Like, oh, let's play it together. Mm-hmm. And so we've been playing River City Girls a lot, which is sort of like an old school beat em up. I'm obsessed. Yeah. It reminds me of Powerpuff Girls. It reminds me of the first game I ever bought for Game Boy Advance. Mm-hmm which was the first video game I ever bought with my own money. It was this Powerpuff Girls game. And they just like went through this school and like beat people up. And (laughs) like, it literally reminds me so much of that. And I love it. Like I've been, I don't know. I haven't felt this way about a video game in a really long time where I like wake up and I'm like, I can't wait to play River City Girls tonight. The the, the sort of branding of it is really cool too. Cause it's like very anime. And Mm -hmm. I know like neither one of us are big, like anime or manga people, but like, it, that's the whole aesthetic, and it's very like girl powery. Mm-hmm. And the music is really good. The too. music, yeah, the soundtrack's amazing. So yeah, we've been having a lot of fun with that. That's been like 
we've been looking for a show to watch together because we usually have a show that we watch but this has been sort of our kind of like thing we do together for the past few weeks so yeah cool um do I have a booger in my nose no okay you're good <laughs> okay that's how to, how to interview <laughs> step one don't talk about your boogers. okay actually so let's get into the the meat of this <laughs> this episode actually while we're at it so i want to like i said talk about interviewing with you guys we i don't know we both interview people you're definitely like this is like actually what he does and yeah. like actually what he went to school for well, you were self-taught with yeah. a little smattering of it in school because i mean if you go to film or even like political science, like you yeah. go to poli sci, yeah. like you get some journalism, like mass communication classes. Yeah, no, I guess that's true. I guess maybe we should like touch on that a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, in my film classes, you know, I had to take broadcast journalism classes. Mm-hmm. I had to learn how to write for the news. I had to learn how to interview people and things like that. But yeah, that was like not my main focus i mean i had like a handful of classes doing that so i guess i do have experience with it but as far as our actual careers this podcast you could take the interviews or leave them and actually i've I've found that people tend to prefer the solo episodes a little bit more whereas i feel like with checkpoint that's a big part of your show right is yeah it is i mean it it can be not so much as not as big as like maybe traditional news or like traditional you know um news entertainment shows if you will um and i think that's more so because of the subject matter sometimes it's just hard to catch up with people and you would think you know even with the internet that it's a lot easier but i mean people's schedules are crazy so yeah um it can be difficult uh getting interviews but we've had a lot more success recently than in the past yeah one thing about interviewing and and obviously half the battle is getting the person to agree to come on the show right but the number one thing that i notice a lot of interviewers don't do and this is so important is like do your research Mm -hmm. and not like glean their wikipedia page or whatever or search their social media or whatever like Try to understand like what's sort of the ethos of their brand Mm -hmm. or if they don't have a brand, because I I hate that kind of stuff sometimes that every person on the planet just has a personal brand. Yeah. Like they don't. But um They should, but they should, maybe. But if if you know, maybe you're yeah, but maybe you're (laughs) interviewing somebody who's not necessarily a like front facing uh person. You Mm -hmm. know, you may be talking to uh Team GM in in our case, you could be talking to somebody like that where they're not necessarily out there like that. But yeah, research number one is like the thing you have to do. Like there, you don't have a choice if you want your interview to be good. Okay, so let's back it up then. Let's back up to getting people on your show because I think that's a big hurdle. That's a big hurdle that I really struggle with. I have this weird like imposter syndrome, especially like you're a legitimate brand and stuff and you have like so a are you. legitimate company you okay awards and stuff. okay but i'm like self look at the set okay this is my home office you know what i mean you have a real studio okay. you have teammates you have you know and and i'm not saying mm-hmm. that's you know better or worse but i think it legitimizes you a little bit yes and i think for me and for somebody and, and maybe you can speak to this for when checkpoint was kind of in its infancy i felt very imposter syndrome and was like, nobody's going to want to come on my show and I'm Mm. afraid to ask everybody. So let's talk a little bit about actually getting people to come on the show. Um, And one thing that you sort of mentioned in what you were just saying is researching. I think research, a lot of people maybe wait to do the research until they get the interview, until they're doing the interview. But for me, like that's been the most successful thing. I've asked big like YouTubers, like people who I'm Mm -hmm. like, they're definitely going to just ignore me or say no. And they've said yes, because I specifically cited like one piece Mm -hmm. of content or like one part of their brand statement that's kind of buried on their website that isn't, like you said, isn't on their Wikipedia page or whatever. So in addition to like research, do you have anything, any tips for that or anything? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is confidence in the ask, right? Not just confidence, but information. So if you're asking for an interview, not every interview will be, you know, about somebody who's got like, 
a new hot thing coming out, right? Especially for those people, because they know you're going to want to talk about that new thing, but maybe this person is more of like a titan of their industry kind of person. They have been around in their authority. So you want to go in and you ask specific, like you ask for specifics. You say, I want to talk about ABC. Yeah. You know, and if the scope of the interview goes beyond that, let it, if they stop you, let them stop you. But yeah, in the ask, you have to say this is what I want to talk about and be very specific because mm-hmm. people don't people don't like vague. Yeah. Like, you know, cuz vague sounds uninitiated. Vague mm-hmm. sounds like you don't know what you're talking about. Vague sounds like you kind of flying by the seat of your pants. Mm-hmm. And if you go in with a specific ask, they go, "Oh, okay, you know, this person knows about this thing and they yeah, okay, cool. I may rock with them." I mean, yeah. you know, just like if somebody asks you in like say specific YouTube video or a specific podcast episode, that makes you feel a lot more as a host For like, sure. "Oh, they've actually listened to my stuff." For sure. Yeah, and I think people also want to know what's in it for them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another thing, you know, I mean, I don't say no to a lot of, um, I'm not that special, first of all, like ET is not like knocking on my door or anything, but, um, I do say no. The only times that I do say no to people who want to Mm -hmm. collaborate with me or, you know, do an interview or whatever is when it is very like, I have no idea who you are or you didn't give me like a good pitch. I can tell that you're just going through a list of like anybody that you can find to get on your show. Um, you just found me in like a Facebook group mm-hmm. and you know, like that's when I say no, because what, like, what am I going to get out of that? Tell me a little bit about the audience that you have that mm-hmm. we're going to be sort of uh, cross promoting and that I'm going to be reaching by being on your show or tell me about your company or like something that makes me Some actually want to yeah, yeah. want to spend my time with you. So, cause it is, I mean, I, you know, I, I actually just did a podcast interview earlier this evening with a friend of mine. It should probably be out soon. So definitely stay tuned for that But <laughs> plug for, for my friend. But he, you know, that's one of the things he said. He was just like, you know, I really appreciate you spending the time because that's the one thing that you cannot get back. And I just mm-hmm. think understanding that, you know, you're, you're, having people spend their time on you is really important and time is really valuable. And especially like with the people that you guys are talking to, yeah. they're busy people. I mean, everybody, people and, I talk to too. And I think like that, especially for anyone out there trying to start a podcast, like be very cognizant of people's time sometimes and be cognizant of your listeners time too. Like that's another thing that I think people often don't do is they'll get a guest that they're such a big fan of and they want to talk to this person for like, 12 hours. And the thing is, is be mindful and cognizant of that. Like what we've learned is that 10 minutes is like the sweet spot. And I think people are more open to say, oh, sure, I'll kick it and talk to you for 20 minutes Mm. as opposed to, yeah, let's come in and sit down and do this hour and a half long Mm -hmm. podcast episode where it's like, no, now I have to plan my day around it as Mm -hmm. opposed to I could just sit down at home and do it. That's actually a really good idea. I did like kind of a variation of this last season, almost like micro interviews where it was like kind of like a compilation. Mm -hmm. So I had people answer a question and send me their answers. And I really liked it. And like, I feel like people really enjoyed that episode. It's just for me, it's a lot of coordination to do something like that. Do you feel like, do you guys do stuff like that on the show? Or do you mostly, like, do you have multi-guest episodes? Or oh, how yeah. Does it, so is that just a lot of work on you, you guys' end then? Like, production and getting everything synced up? and It can be, but the, the beauty of doing something full-time is that you got five days a week to do it. So even if our weekly episode comes out Wednesday, we got, you know, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday to do any interviews or any segments that we need mm-hmm. to do. So that makes it a lot easier but let's say, you know, this is not your full-time thing or, you know, whatever. I think it's a lot better to um, batch record, mm-hmm. you know, maybe get interviews that aren't necessarily time sensitive, which is, I think, easier to do in podcasting than in anything else. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that would be my advice for that is just try yeah. to think of stuff that's pretty evergreen. Okay. So do you have any tips for asking interview questions that are not like, Hi, tell me, like, basically the question I asked you, tell me who you are and what you do. Yeah. Like, that is so boring. The Freelance Friday podcast needs a revamp, okay? 
<laughs> do you have any <laughs> advice for asking non-boring interview questions? I mean, that's where the research comes in, though, right? Yeah. You know, because, like, if you don't know, that's where you do the surface-level questions. Mm -hmm. But also, like, you have to search for context sometimes even within the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that takes active listening, which is a skill that I would say is a lot less utilized than you would think, even within, you know, journalism or, you know, uh, broadcast or whatever, is that, you know, listen for inflection and listen for where people are like really passionate about something. Cause every now and then you may have to just come up with something on the fly mm -hmm. and then ask a really deep question. But if you're talking about the research, yeah, just, you know, that's where those sort of more meatier questions come from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let's talk about virtual interviews because this is probably the number one question that I got about, mm -hmm. you know, interviewing. Do you want, can I, I'll walk through my process yeah, of you, how yeah, I do a virtual interview. Like all of your interviews are like 100% for the most part. Yeah. Besides interviews. you and Ryan, <laughs> yeah. you and Ryan are like the two people that I've interviewed in real life, I think. And JC, my friend JC. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what I do, number one, you have to have a microphone. Example A, if you're watching, this is a YouTube episode, by the way, so you can watch us talk if you want on YouTube. Um, but yeah, so number one, obviously, you have to have a microphone, and I use Zoom. So I've tried, like, all of the different interviewing websites, and they all, for me personally and my equipment – do not work very well. I tried Squadcast. I tried Zencaster. Mm -hmm. And those are actually pretty nice to use, especially if you're kind of just starting out and you're a little bit overwhelmed by the tech. Because what I would recommend if you're a newbie is using one of those tools and then just pulling up a recorder on your own computer, like Audacity, QuickTime, even Final Cut, like yeah, whatever you audition. have. Audition, yeah. And doing a backup recording. So that way if Zencaster, Squadcast, you know, whatever does blink out, do something weird, you still will have it and, and ask your guests to do, to do the same thing on their end. So anyway, I personally, those tools, I don't know if it's our internet, like my internet here or what it was, but I lost part of parts of recordings and things like that. So I uh, settled for Zoom. Zoom is totally free to use is for one to one people. I think if you do groups of like four or more, you have to pay yeah, or something. Pay, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's totally free. And there's a way there's a setting to actually split the audio so that, you know, if Norris is talking on the other line, it's like, it'll give me two separate audio tracks, which is key because editing one long blob of, you get all the background it's a, noise. It's a nightmare. Yeah. 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 So that's what I use. And then I also still do that backup though. So mm -hmm. I always ask my guests if they can, if they know how, whatever to do a backup. And then I do the same thing just in case. Um, anything gets messed up. And also the backup copies are usually going to be better quality because you're speaking directly into your computer versus going through the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's what I do. That's what really works well for me. Um, what about you? Yeah, I mean, if obviously if you can't get it in person, um, because we're dealing a lot with like gamers and people in the video game industry, there's a lot of interviews we do through Discord. Hmm. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that app, but Discord... Um, has different servers, quote unquote, different servers for like different groups. So you go in and it's almost as if it's like a Facebook group, but every group is broken down into sort of sub boards. It's, it's like, like Reddit kind of? Not necessarily, but it's like every uh, Discord server is its own miniature message board. Hmm. And through there, you can do voice chat and video chat. And the sound quality is pretty good. So cool. uh, again, another free app. Um, but before Discord, or if we can't use Discord, Zoom is something that we use as well. I have been using for years, honestly, um, simply because it it really is kind of the most stable thing out there. But as, as you know, as you said, as you said, um, having them have the audio on their side and you having your backup audio on your side, and especially if they could send that audio to you, that's the best way to do it mm -hmm. because nothing's going to replace raw audio that's yeah. always going to be the best and highest quality yeah and and my experience is i feel like everybody nowadays knows how to use google drive so or to send like you can just drop your audio clip in an email and it'll convert it to a drive file so that's what i always tell my guests is like hey just email me that clip yeah. when you're done and they tend to be okay and with at that. this point digital negatives all have like microphones too like i mean mm -hmm. just about everybody has like at least 
at the bare minimum, like a Blue Yeti or some other condenser microphone mm-hmm. at the crib. Some people even have like gaming headsets, even nine gamers for some reason. And those <laughs> are better than just trying to speak into your laptop. Mic. Yeah, for sure. I, I, my first microphone was the Blue Snowball, mm-hmm. which is fine. Like, it, honestly, like if you're starting on a podcast, it's totally fine. The whole season one of the podcast was recorded on that. And when I listen to it now, I'm like, hmm. Yeah, wasn't so great, but it was totally fine. You know, like it was totally fine. And I, especially if you're an interview guest, like that's fine, yeah. honestly, I would say. Yeah. I mean, you're probably more of a microphone snob than I am. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you have to be. <laughs> I have to be. And you, and you could really tell, and you could really hear it when somebody has a really bad microphone. But like our stuff goes out on the radio. So yeah. like it has to be good. Like there's kind of no excuse. But like, not to say that you don't have, you know, you wouldn't want the audio quality, but yeah, like I've listened to a, a lot of your interview episodes and they sound perfectly fine. And I think that's more than okay for podcasts. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Is there like an entry level microphone that you have that you'd recommend like something like this or something better? Yeah. I think the Yetis are a really good brand because they are fairly affordable. I mm-hmm. mean, you could catch them on sale for like under a hundred bucks. And the thing is, is that their, their use case is for almost anything. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you're doing interviews, got a setting on there. If you're doing live recordings, there are settings. So the Blue Yetis are a really good um, entry-level microphone, I would say. Sure. Um, Sure and audio. Sure is like more higher end, but Mm -hmm. Audio Technica has a lot of really good entry-level stuff. So um, those are kind of three brands I would think about. Cool. What about in-person interviews? So how, how does that process differ from what we just talked about i mean there's all there's the coordination of travel yeah basically for <laughs> most people like because for, for us most people are coming to us because we have the studio right um so that's infinitely easier to just say here's the address show up yeah um but when we're getting live interviews like for a remote recording let's say we're at a convention or a tournament or something like that it becomes much much more difficult And I think at that point, you just got to commit to either being the person or having a person with you who is just like your people wrangler, (laughs) where it's like, you know, you may have a place that you're, you set up shop at and then you run and go grab somebody. I remember we were at E3, which was a big convention and uh, we literally took all our equipment, set up when we were not supposed to set up, it was completely like not legal because we did not have a permit to do that. (laughs) And we set up and they ran, you know, we grabbed people and brought them over to our recording thing. And, and, you know, it was very ad hoc and very guerrilla style, but it's like when you're doing in-person interviews, you got to kind of do that stuff. And you also can't be an audio snob Mm -hmm. with live interviews Mm -hmm. because you just, you're never going to get studio quality mm. stuff Just when you're take in the what wild. you can get yeah yeah, yeah. okay i have a question yeah. so about that especially i mean i'm sure that you guys when you go to like big cons like twitch con and e3 and stuff like that you probably have like a wish list of people that you yeah. want to make sure that you track down but i feel like there has to be some level of uh making things up on the fly right a ton of it a lot <laughs> like of it. um you, how do you do that you well, the thing is, you do as much of the work as you can before you get there. Um, so E3 happens in June. After we get our like credentials, we immediately start reaching out to people. So we got credentialed for this year in like February. So March 1, like we start sending out who's... Who's going? Who are who's tweeting saying they got their credentials? Who's tweeting saying they're going? So we start reaching out all the way in March for something happening in June. Mm-hmm. So they know as soon as they touch down, oh, I have this really cool thing with the, you know, with checkpoint. Yeah. Awesome. You know, and another thing is like send questions beforehand. Mm, um, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. So I I, I can I'll put that I'll put that in Table the parking lot. I'll put yeah, that in park the parking lot, lot for a minute. Parking lot. Um but yeah, you do as much of the work beforehand. And then once you get there, obviously there'll be somebody maybe that you vibe with or you meet or you see. And at that point, yeah, just, you know, just go for it. Like you can't be afraid to ask either. You know, I met Ed Boone, the guy who created Mortal Kombat. And the first thing I asked him for was an interview. And the worst thing he could say is no. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's true. I mean, honestly, for me, I've had very few people say no. Like most people get are flattered by it. Even if they have a much bigger reach and following than you, they're still like, oh, wow, that's so nice. I've mm-hmm. never been like, oh, how dare they ask me for an interview? Like, why? you know, no one's going to be offended by it. So yeah. if anything, I think they'll just say, I don't have time right now, or that's not something I'm prioritizing right now, you know, which is not, it's pretty yeah. not offensive. Or they'll ignore you, which is like pretty fine. <laughs> you know, for me, it's like, whatever. Okay. I want to talk about a lot, actually. <laughs> All right. <laughs> a lot. We've already talked about a lot, but I want to break kind of the pre-interview process down yeah. a little bit. So you talked about sending questions beforehand. For sure. That's something that you like? You like to do that? Yeah. Okay. Why? Yeah, think, so they can okay. be prepared? Yeah. You want people to be prepared, obviously. I mean, first of all, there may be people who have publicists or PR people yeah. who will not let you do the interview with it without at least some of the questions being sent right. beforehand. So I think that is you know a deal breaker you have to yeah um but if it's somebody who has not given you that stipulation i think as a courtesy you should send maybe you know if if it's a 10 minute interview it shouldn't be more than six questions but if it's longer than that maybe you send three or four and then you have the rest for when you get there for when they get there Mm -hmm. but i don't think there's anything wrong with that because you want people to be prepared and the last thing you want a guest to feel is ambushed Mm -hmm. so you know if you're a person who, especially people who are dealing with like a lot of celebrity news, or maybe you're a podcast that's trying to start up, you're trying to make waves in a certain industry. You never want to. Let's say you get Mary Barra, you know, the the CEO of GM on your show. You, there's no way she's going to sit down with you and she doesn't know what you guys are going to talk about. Yeah. So do you recommend? So okay. So that makes sense. So what I do sometimes I maybe I'm like pretty bad at this but I for me and my show I'm always like I want it to be a very conversational show I never want it to be because I've been on I've been on the other end of interviews before where they do send me every single question and while I do kind of appreciate it I also feel like I I'm like reading from a script when Mm -hmm. they're asking me the questions because I've already thought about it before and I think it loses a little bit of its you know I, I totally get what you're saying and I think he's you're dealing with a different, different kind of person, you know, yeah. these people are like, not that the people I interview aren't super busy too, but it's just a little bit of a different style of show. Like you're a true news E mm-hmm. type show. Whereas mine is more about like having conversations and yeah. some of that, you know, but, but I do agree with you. I think that sending something, what I've been doing lately is just sending a sampling. So I'll be like, here are kind of the standard questions that I'm going to ask, or if there is something really specific like hey i saw you did a video on that like i when melody was on the show um she did a video about student loan debt Mm -hmm. or or something like that and so i said like i'm gonna ask you specifically about xyz or uh you know if there's specific call outs that i want and then i'll I will kind of gauge the time yeah. as we're interviewing. Sometimes I kind of have to come up with extra things on the fly. Sometimes they'll say yeah. something that I didn't even think about and then I'll kind of throw in there. So. Yeah. And I mean, but that's, I think that's the flow in the same way that that's the way a conversation flows. That's the way an interview should flow too. So, you know, I think it's smart to send people at the very least a little example but you should always be like going back to the whole active listening thing. You should always be prepared to sort of dive deeper into something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's been plenty of times where, you know, we've been in the studio or we've been recording a show or interview and somebody says something that, you know, all of it, like the light bulb, like we've seen the light bulb simultaneously yeah. go off in everybody's head. <laughs> and you see us doing like our, like we have hand signals in the studio so we can know like, <laughs> you know, cool. like 30 seconds or, you know, break or wrap it up. Like there have been times where people go like, bring it back. Like, I got a <laughs> question. Like, you know, so it, it's, you got to always be prepared for that too. And yeah. maybe sometimes just like write little notes or themes, yeah. you know, where if somebody says something about like a car or something, you go. That's what yeah. I do. I, I have an Evernote when I'm doing virtual interviews. I have an Evernote uh, notebook or note page, whatever it's called mm-hmm. in there, pulled up with their questions. And then I'll mute my microphone, though. If I'm on Zoom, you can mute. I don't mute it on the microphone either because that makes a noise. So I mute yeah. it on Zoom when I'm typing because if you don't, it's so awkward. Like somebody's talking, you're like, clank, clank, clank. It's so annoying. Yeah. So I have another question. 
okay, well, maybe I more have a story time. Okay. <laughs> so, story time. People suck when you talk to them. Oh like. my gosh. No, not at all. I feel like I like people to be prepared and I like people to prepare me when I'm on the receiving end of mm-hmm. an interview. But so I actually had this experience recently where I was contacted to be on a show and they sent me over an email that was, I'm not kidding you. I felt like, you know, when you go to the doctor's office for the first time and you have like 10 oh, pages, all the new inf- the information sheets, like yeah. my entire life story, like my medical history. I mean, they didn't really ask that, but like, that's what they it might felt as like, well, uh, all of these terms and conditions, like you must like, a, like, I don't know, sh- share the show and like align with the values and do this and mm-hmm. do this and and, like, while I appreciate that they were very organized, and I know, no doubt, that that really helped them, I ignored it. And I feel kind of bad because I kind of wanted to be on the show, but I'm like, this is too much work. Mm-hmm. You know, no offense, but people are busy, and I don't – I barely have time to fill out, like, a one – like, a five-question Google form, nonetheless, like, ten pages and, like, uploading all this stuff and, like – so – do you guys do that? Do nope. you guys do any? <laughs> all right, there we no, go. No, because that is that. First of all, that is the absolute wrong way to go about it, mm-hmm. right? If you are a company, because that sounds like that comes from a company mm-hmm. and not just that's a person. It's like a podcaster. That like, was a podcaster. Yeah, like a new. podcast. I almost said a cuss word on your podcast. <laughs> like for real, that is it's it's wholly unnecessary. Yeah. If you know a massive publicly traded company does not see it necessary for, you know, you to get hit with all these stipulations. If you come on the show, it's with a certain amount of expectations. You will follow FCC guidelines. Yeah. And if you cuss, whatever, we'll edit it and yeah. post if it's still a manageable interview. Um, it belongs to us. Yeah. And we'll share it on social media. So if you say something that you regret, if you don't hit us up in time and it goes public, that's on you. Mm-hmm. Like, well, the thing is, it wasn't even about, like, I would almost more understand if it was that, sorry, if it was mm-hmm. that, like, you know, that kind of stuff. But it wasn't even like that. It was just like, it was just like asking for the whole, my whole life story and like my business story and everything, which I, I get, but like, then why did you ask me to so be on your show? Like, shouldn't interview? you already know, or shouldn't you be able to be the one yeah. doing the research? Like go to my website. So I don't know. Copy my about section. But like, that's what they, I do. But for- if they sent you all that stuff, then what's the purpose of the interview? Right. That's you what know, I mean. And then there's nothing that they need to find out about. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. pretty and- silly. Yeah, I agree. And like for people's intros and stuff that I read, generally what I do is I'll just find their website or their Instagram bio, honestly, whatever, wherever they have something like a bio about themselves. And I'll tweak that for my show. And then I'll send it over to them maybe the day before, or I'll read it to them while we're on the Zoom call mm-hmm. before we start recording and be like, hey, is this okay? And then if they have something else that they want to add, then I'll, I'll kind of tweak it. But generally, I don't think I've ever had anyone be like, no, that sucks. Because like it's on your website. So mm-hmm. that's I'm, what I'm going to take as your public facing bio. Yeah, but like I mean, as as somebody who's more so in like the world of business and people with startups and freelancers and stuff like that, like very rarely are people talking to you in my like about like a new product or a new thing. It is more, you know, um background and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So like how do you then, you know, try to find like how do you convince your questioning then because I know for us it's very like right now and timely and you know unless I'm talking to somebody who's been in industry for 30 years or whatever like how do you get people from going off the rails and Mm -hmm. talking about their quote-unquote business journey and making it an hour-long episode honestly that's a good question and that's kind of one of the things that I think you know, I survey my audience and I, I ask them what they like, what they don't like every season to try to improve the show. And I do think that people tend to enjoy the solo episodes more because of that, because they're like quick. Like I give, I've moved the show. It used to be an hour long to 45 minutes to an hour. I moved it to being closer to thir- the 30 minute mark. And I just feel like I kind of go in, give the information and I'm out. So I've been trying to sort of replicate that in my interviews, not to say that we don't care about the fluff and the story and the journey and all that stuff, but just like shorten it a little mm-hmm. bit. <laughs> so maybe on in season one, I would ask 
lots of questions about like, tell me about like how you grew up and like, mm-hmm. you know, like the whole, now I'll ask like one question and then hop into a really deep dive into one topic. Like for this, for example, yeah. I want to talk about interviewing. I don't want to talk about, even though you're an interesting person, I don't really want to talk about, you know, your childhood in this yeah. episode and like whatever. Well, it's not relevant. Right. So we're going to talk about one key topic. So that's sort of what I've been trying to do lately. And I, I feel like people really have been responding well to it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I don't know. I feel like that was pretty helpful for me. Um, do you feel like there's anything that I missed about interviewing that no, you wanted to cover? I mean, I think, you know, just be confident is the main thing. Don't feel like, you know, I, I know it's hard to get over imposter syndrome. I think we, all of us at some point have had it, but at some point you just got to act like a professional and just make the ask and do what you need to do. Um, but I think the biggest thing, especially in our field, and I would say this to anybody doing a podcast is go in knowing, go in knowing only your research, if that makes any sense. Don't try to act like you are the expert in the room. Mm. Because I hear a lot of interviews where people try to be more of an expert than the person that they're interviewing. And that is the worst kind of interview ever because yeah. that makes the guests superfluous. It makes them feel uh, underappreciated and it makes them feel like they wasted their time. Because if you the expert, why don't they just listen to you then? Yeah, I was on the receiving end of one of those before too and it was really awkward. Actually, I thought of one last question for you. Sure. I notice, and I'm going to see what happens when I edit this podcast, but <laughs> so because we're recording on one microphone, uh, I did an episode like this with my friend Ryan and I noticed because it was on one, one microphone, it was one track together. So it was kind of, it's kind of hard, harder to edit these episodes. And I noticed that I say like, yeah. Cool. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, all the time, (laughs) which is a sign of active listening. It's not meant to be disrespectful, but I wanted to shake myself. I texted him. I was like, Ryan, I'm the most annoying person ever. Why are you friends with me? And how do you, do you have any advice for that? Like, do you do Um, that? Do you feel like that's like, should you just shut yourself up, put tape over your mouth? Like, what do you do? You you don't shut yourself up. You, you, you feel like you wait until you feel like somebody's completed a thought. Because at that point, the only time you should be interjecting, at least based off our, my experience and, and how I've been told, you interject yourself when new information or a new question is to be presented. So, mm-hmm, it's cool, <laughs> but it's cool like once or twice. Like, you know, there are, there are moments where you hear it after every sort of complete thought, and that is not good. Because on a recording, on a recording, it sounds very not genuine. Even if you are, even if, because it is a sign of active listening, but it can come off as like very like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, (laughs) okay, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, you know. And like, and that's like, no offense. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I like that. And I I think it's just something that I try to be really a lot more conscious of. But also, if you're somebody who is like me, if you are recording on Zoom or whatever you're doing digitally, I will sometimes mute myself when they're talking. Uh, But I kind of don't like to do that too much either because you want a look, you want... You want it to sound like a conversation. Mm-hmm. You don't want them to be like talking, you know, whatever. But if you feel like you're doing it so, so much, maybe just mute yourself every once in a while at least. Or when they're kind of going off for a long time, just mute yourself. And what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, just like keeping track of it. If yeah. you feel like like make make a tally Swear or something. <laughs> yeah, like make a tally every time you see yourself saying yeah or, mm-hmm, or something like that. And last tip is I've tried to shift that. I don't know if you saw, if you're watching on YouTube, um, when he was saying that, I was really thinking about it and I was nodding a nod, even if they can't see you, you know. No, it's it's It's, it's a way to get that out. It's a way to not do that. No, yeah. that's, that's literally a technique. I use it every interview we do. Mm-hmm. Um, y- you're right. Even if they can't see you, you just do it. You go. It, it, because it is, it's your way of making a confirmation subconsciously. So you don't have to say it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a very, 
that's a very no. It's fun. See, it's fun. See, here's the thing. It's cool. Stuff like that is cool if we're just if it's just willy nilly free or whatever. But if like you're trying to do like a rigid like. 2020 style mm-hmm. you know interview yeah shut up <laughs> all right and with that we're gonna shut up thank you again to norris howard aka great laker nor i follow AKA, me on instagram and twitter yes i'll leave his links down below i'm also gonna leave checkpoint xp down in the description box and in the show notes do you have any you know sign off where can people find you what do you what do you that's where say? you can that's, that's where you can find me she got them all pretty much locked down um oh also uh checkpoint xp on campus uh college esports so if you got some young ones with some little brothers and nephews or something who's in college holla at us because that show's pretty cool too thursdays on twitch 10 p.m easter it's- very cool. It looks very professional. And Norris is like the talking head on the wall like because <laughs> he's virtual and it looks very cool if you ask me. But all right. Well, thanks for joining. And I will talk to the podcast listeners next week. Next week will be the last show before I take a little break for the holidays. So be sure to tune into that. And thanks for listening and watching. Twos.